Not so long ago, network marketing companies wanted people to join their companies just for product discounts. In fact, they set the prices for their starter kits, enrollment fees, and products perfectly so that it was easy to see how it was cheaper to join as a representative and buy products at the representative price than to order as a customer. As a result, many people join network marketing companies as representatives just for product discounts. While in the past this was not a problem, today that is no longer true. One of the elements of a pyramid scheme is the lack of retail customers and pyramid schemes are illegal. In the Omnitrition, Trek Alliance, Equinox, and Burn Lounge cases, courts found problems with the payment of commissions on sales of products to participants in the income opportunity because of a lack of retail customers. Network marketing companies operate under the jurisdiction of several types of legal authorities, including the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, the Food and Drug Administration, state laws, and the activities of state attorneys general. In 2007, a company called Burn Lounge was shut down by a U.S. District Court due to the FTC's concern that it was operating a pyramid scheme, selling products that were purchased only by its representatives while publishing deceptive earnings claims. In all of these cases, regulators made the point that having customers who are not themselves representatives is very important. More recently, in 2015, the FTC sued Vima, an Arizona-based network marketing company, because it believed that the company was operating a pyramid scheme. The assets of the company were frozen pending a hearing which occurred a few weeks later. At the hearing, the judge expressed concerns about Vima's lack of customer sales according to the FTC's definition of customer and the recruitment by to qualify emphasis within Vima's business culture. He ruled that Vima could continue its operations for now but only with significant changes to its business model. According to Vima, it had plenty of customers. In its defense, Vima argued that affiliates who did not buy startup packs or recruit any affiliates were in fact behaving just like customers, and so they should be permitted to be classified as customers. The court disagreed. It did not buy the argument that people enrolled as affiliates could be reclassified as customers if they weren't earning compensation through the company's pay plan. Instead, the court viewed these affiliates as failed associates, victims, imposing strict penalties upon Vima to ensure that Vima would not create any more victims. The judge instructed Vima to change its compensation plan so that it included the following restrictions. Vima may not sell any startup packs and affiliates' personal purchases cannot be counted toward an activity requirement to earn multi-level compensation. Only purchases made by one's personally enrolled affiliates and customers can count for activity requirements. In order to earn compensation through its compensation plan, at least 51% of the volume in an affiliate's downline must come from orders placed by customers. These rules were highly unusual for multi-level marketing companies, and they had a significant impact on the enrollment of new affiliates and the payment of field compensation by Vima. In the first commission run after Vima's business operations resumed, upon the sales volume of approximately $2 million, only $30,000 in commissions were paid out. Why was it so low? Because almost no one qualified to earn compensation. In July 2016, the FTC negotiated a settlement with Herbalife that required the company to pay $200 million and fundamentally restructure its business in many ways. One of the many changes imposed upon Herbalife was that it would provide proof going forward that its products were being sold to real customers, customers who are not distributors. Another was that distributors cannot earn compensation upon downline sales without a sufficient percentage of downline sales to customers. 
While a lack of sufficient customer sales has been one of the reasons that network marketing companies have been investigated or shut down, the Direct Selling Association has been lobbying for years at the state level to pass legislation in several states defining what exactly is a pyramid scheme. None of these state anti-pyramid statutes include a specific requirement for sales to customers who are non-participants in the income opportunity. In the absence of federal legislation that defines what exactly is a pyramid scheme, the FTC, with its special and broad powers, has taken matters into its own hands by petitioning courts for injunctions upon companies. In these cases, a lack of sales to customers who are not independent representatives themselves has been one of their concerns, but not the only one. Companies pursued by the FTC always have had other questionable business practices, including Vima. If you are thinking that this federal definition of a pyramid scheme is money at this time, you'd be right. As a proactive response to the Herbalife judgment, Representative Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee introduced the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act of 2016, H.R. 5230, a bill referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce in the U.S. House of Representatives. Similar to state anti-pyramid statutes, this bill defines the ultimate user as a non-participant in the plan or operation or a participant who purchases reasonable amounts of products, goods, services, or intangible property for personal use and whose purchase is not made solely, that means only, for the purposes of qualifying for increased compensation. Put in layman's terms, this bill would prevent FTC actions against companies based on a lack of customer sales. This bill, like all others, is proposed legislation that has not been approved yet. We don't know if and when it may be approved, or if it will be, how similar the final version will be to this first version. What does all of this mean to you and your company? The VEMA penalties do not apply to any other company other than VEMA. The restructuring of the Herbalife business applies only to Herbalife. They are not laws applicable to other companies. However, the FTC and various courts like to use the most recent cases as precedents, which means in future cases, other judges and courts may issue similar rulings. If you are the owner or executive of a network marketing company, you can do either nothing and hope the FTC doesn't bother you in the future, or you could take preemptive action to increase the percentage of your sales that are made to non-participants in your compensation plan. Here are my recommended strategies. Don't encourage people to join your company as independent representatives just for product discounts. Charge an enrollment fee that's high enough to be a representative that people don't pay just to become representatives for product discounts. But be sure not to pay any compensation upon the required fee. Don't charge nothing to be an independent representative with your company. Optionally, charge a lower fee to become a preferred customer to be able to order at the same low prices as representatives. Sell products or services that people will buy even if they are not earning any money through your company's compensation plan. Assess an annual or monthly fee to remain a representative. Charge customers a fair price for your products or services, one that they will pay. Use sticks or carrots to increase customer sales. If you're in need of help with your company's strategies or company's compensation plan to motivate and reward customer acquisition, contact me at Sylvina Consulting and we'll talk confidentially and confidently about your situation. To learn even more about this and other many topics, attend a Direct Selling Edge conference to gain a deeper understanding of the current statuses of the law. You'll begin by tracing decades of fascinating and important history with an MLM attorney. Then you will learn the intricacies of the September 2015 VEMA and July 2016 Herbalife FTC actions and what they mean for all direct selling companies. 
More importantly, you will learn 10 specific strategies to keep your MLM or party plan company safe from federal and state regulators. At the Direct Selling Edge conference, you will also learn more about how to design or improve your company's compensation plan, what to teach your independent representatives about how to use social media the right way, how to attract and develop more field leaders, how to build a great company culture, how to build an effective distributor compliance department, what you should do before you obtain MLM software, and much more. I urge you not to put your head in the sand or to stand still like a deer in headlights. The rules of the road for network marketing companies have changed, which means the business model of the past. When companies purposely encouraged everyone to enroll for product discounts is no longer a safe approach to doing business. If you are overwhelmed by what I've shared with you, or if you have just a few questions, let's talk. I'm Jay at Sylvina Consulting. I look forward to speaking with you. In August 2015, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, sued a company called Vima, which is based in Phoenix, Arizona, a network marketing company, because it believed the company was operating a pyramid scheme. They froze the assets of the company and the assets of the owners of the company, pending a hearing that occurred a few weeks later. At the hearing, the judge expressed concerns about Vima's lack of customer sales according to the FTC's definition of customer, and the recruitment by to qualify emphasis within Vima's culture. He ruled that Vima could continue its operations for now, but only with significant changes to its business model. According to Vima, it had plenty of customers. In its defense, Vima said that affiliates who didn't buy startup packs or recruit any, any affiliates were in fact behaving like customers and they should be permitted to be reclassified as customers. Part of the discussion was over this issue of who is a customer. And the court disagreed. What the court said was, we don't buy the argument that people enrolled as affiliates could be reclassified as customers if they weren't earning compensation through the company's pay plan. We think these affiliates are really failed affiliates. They're not customers. And they impose very strict penalties upon Vima to ensure that Vima wouldn't create any more victims. And the Federal Trade Commission initiated an investigation and uh, went to a judge and got an injunction. And as a result of a hearing that they had, they imposed a bunch of penalties on Vima as a result of what they perceived to be improper behavior. The rules that they required of them, I can tell you, were very unusual. So I'm going to tell you what they said in, this, in, their, in their, their judgment. They said, you can no longer sell startup packs. What's a startup pack? A startup pack is a group of products that's designed to be sold specifically to network marketing representatives. Okay, so when you join the company, buy this bunch of product. And they pay commissions on those products. And so the court said, you can't sell those anymore. No packs, just for distributors. They said also, listen, if you're going to have a volume requirement, nothing that the affiliate personally purchases can count toward an activity requirement. These rules are highly unusual. There's nothing out there in federal regulations and laws that says you can't sell startup packs and you can't count personal purchases by affiliates toward activity requirements. Did the punishment fit the crime? The answer is no. They did some things that were problematic, but the, the courts, the, the FTC and the court's judgment against them was extreme, definitely extreme. So why are companies shut down? Let's talk about that. 
There's a difference between a pyramid scheme and a legal direct selling company. Most companies in this space are shut down because they are pyramid schemes or they are Ponzi schemes. They are illegal businesses masquerading as legal businesses. That's why most of these types of companies are shut down. They are shut down because of insufficient customer sales. Vima was not the first company to face this fate. Several years ago, there was a company called Burn Lounge. How many of you have heard of them, Burn Lounge? One person. Burn Lounge was an interesting model. Burn Lounge was selling uh, websites where people could buy music. And they were selling concert discount packages. You could be a mogul if you bought this wonderful website where you could sell music and we'll give you discounts on concert tickets. And it turned out that 95% of the representatives bought the mogul package and only 3% of the customers did. In other words, the mogul package was not for everyone. It was just for distributors. And that's one of the reasons why Burn Lounge was shut down and found to be a pyramid scheme. So clearly, lack of sufficient customer sales is an issue. And lack of what customers buy is an issue. So one of the things that the FTC was worried about in Vima's case was they assumed that they were selling a lot of startup packs. Startup packs are only sold to distributors. They actually got that wrong. Vima's recruiting had actually leveled off before they, they pursued them. And only 8% of their sales were in startup packs. The court thought it was more than 50%. So at one point it probably was. But at the time when they pursued them, it wasn't. Okay. Income claim violations. You can make a million dollars by joining this company. Product claim violations. It can cause you to, you know, it cures cancer and does all these other great things. Clearly things that are illegal. Protected class violations. This thing cures acne. That's a protected class of people. This thing helps you live longer. Give it to people that have cancer. All sorts of things that are, are protected class issues and other questionable business practices. So there are direct selling companies that are shut down for very valid reasons. Was Vima doing something wrong? Yeah, they were. I want to tell you one other thing that Vima did that I would tell you is a, a cardinal mistake. One of the things in Vima's compensation was this two way of getting qualified for compensation. One was to buy $80 worth of product yourself. The other one was to sell $200 worth of product to customers. $80 in your own personal purchases or sell $200 to customers. How do you think most people qualified? But the product, it's a lot easier to buy $80 worth of product than sell $200. The court had a major problem with that. Major problem with that because you, they said you have a buy to qualify culture. People are buying the 80 because you've set the 200 as the alternative requirement. And I will tell you, direct selling companies should never, ever have a lower sales volume requirement for personal purchases than sales to customers. So, while a lack of sufficient customer sales has been one of the reasons that network marketing companies have been shut down or investigated, the Direct Selling Association, which is a lobbying organization for direct selling companies based in Washington, D.C., has been lobbying for years at the state level to pass legislation in several states defining what is a pyramid scheme. So there's a bunch of states that have laws that say, this is what a pyramid scheme is. But at the federal level, there is no legislation that clearly defines what a pyramid scheme is. Nowhere in the state anti-pyramid regulations is any mention of the prohibition or limits on distributor-based purchases. We are not willing to concede that a purchase by a distributor is worth any less than a purchase by a customer. And there is no federal pyramid scheme legislation in place today. So in the absence of federal legislation that defines what is a pyramid scheme, the Federal Trade Commission which has very special and broad powers to protect the public, has taken matters into its own hands. They've become the sheriff in town. And they've petitioned courts for injunctions upon companies. They basically prepare a bunch of paperwork, give it to a judge, and say, Judge, this company is so bad, you've got to shut them down, freeze their assets, you've got to take action. And a judge looks at the evidence from the Federal Trade Commission and goes, most of the time, okay. So in these cases where the Federal Trade Commission has done this, a lack of sales to customers who are not independent representatives has been one of their concerns, but not the only one. One of the things the FTC was concerned about, but they were also concerned about other questionable business practices. So in all of the documents the FTC has provided, they talk about this lack of customer sales, and then they talk about the other things. So in May of this year, in response to the VEMA case, 
Representative Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee introduced the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act of 2016. It's called H.R. 5230. It's a bill in the House of Representatives. It was referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce. So similar to the state anti-pyramid statutes, this bill defines an ultimate user of product as a non-participant in the plan or a participant who purchases reasonable amounts of products for personal use and whose purchase is not made only for the purposes of qualifying for increased compensation. So in layman's terms, this bill was intended to prevent the FTC from coming after companies based on a lack of customer sales. So that was the Direct Selling Association saying, we need to introduce a bill that will stop the FTC from what they're doing. So this bill is proposed legislation that hasn't been approved. We don't know if it'll be approved, we don't know when it'll be approved, and we don't know what it's going to look like when it's approved. So at this point, it's the Direct Selling Association's attempt to say, we need to have a federal law that will stop the FTC. Now, the FTC isn't stupid. So the FTC's attitude is, we're going to do all we can to kill that law, because we want to have the freedom to go after companies, because we think this customer thing is really important. That's their, that's their position. So what does VEMA mean for you? Does it mean nothing? Does it mean everything? The VEMA penalties, which were imposed upon one company, are not a law. They are a punishment for an action that a judge imposed based upon being petitioned by the FTC. However, the Federal Trade Commission and other courts look at most recent cases as precedents, which means in future cases, other judges may say, well, the VEMA judge said this, so I'm going to say that. So even though it's not the law, it's like in the absence of law, what do you look at? Other cases. Right? You look at recent cases. That's what, you, that's what you look at. So, if you're the owner or the executive of a network marketing company, you can either do nothing and hope the FTC doesn't bother you and the Direct Selling Association is uh, successful in getting its bill passed, or you could take preemptive action. Action to increase the percentage of your sales that are made to non-participants in your comp plan. So we're going to talk about that. What are preemptive action? Number one. You can decide we are not going to encourage people to join our company as independent reps just for product discounts. We are not going to do that. So you have a decision to make. Are you going to not encourage people to join your company just for product discounts? How do you do that? How do you make it so people don't join just for product discounts? Simple answer. The price is the same whether you're a rep or not. You only pay the enrollment fee. You only buy a starter kit if you want to be a rep. If you just want the lowest price, be a customer. That's the first thing you can do. Second thing you can do is you can charge an enrollment fee that's high enough to be a representative that people don't become reps just for product discounts. I'm talking about setting a barrier high enough that people only pay it if they're interested in the income opportunity. We need to make sure that any required fee to be a representative is legal only if you don't pay commissions on it. If it's a required fee and you pay commissions, it's illegal. It gets back to the, we can't require our representatives to buy product to qualify. It's the same thing, just wrapped in a, in a sales kit. <clears throat> Don't charge nothing to be a rep. Preemptive action. What else can you do? Sell stuff that people will buy even if they're not earning any money. What does that mean? That means make your products and services attractive to customers. You can't have customers if customers don't want your products. That's important. Charge customers a fair price. Whether it's the same price as your reps or a fair price, make it a fair price. And use sticks or carrots to increase customer sales. Sticks and carrots, what does that mean? A stick means you have to have them. Here with a stick, here's a stick. To qualify for compensation, you must have three customers. If you don't have three customers, you don't qualify. That's a stick. That says you gotta have them, we're not gonna pay you. A carrot says, listen, if you have enough volume between you and your customers, I'll pay you this extra bonus. I'll make it attractive for you to have customers. Maybe I'll have a revenue pool for people who sign up the most number of new customers in a month. They can share in a pot of money. You can do things to encourage customer sales. You can either take preemptive action or you can put your head in the sand. You have a choice as a direct selling company and it has direct impact on your comp plan. Direct. The comp plan specifies the rules. Now, let's talk about Herbalife. In December 2012, it's almost three and a half, four years ago, 
A guy by the name of Bill Ackman, who's a hedge fund manager of a hedge fund called Pershing Square, decided to short Herbalife stock. He did this for a reason. What hedge fund managers do is they basically bet on the success or failure of a company. In his case, he said, I think I can get this company to go out of business. So I'm going to do is I'm going to sell their, st their stock short. And as an activist investor, he's going to do things to help hedge his bet. This is what he did. He contacted the FTC and he said, listen, you need to shut this company down. They are big and they are a problem. There's a lot of people that have complaints. You need to investigate them. And the FTC went, okay, let me look at your evidence. And he began a research campaign to prove his accusation. That millions of dollars, created videos, created websites, talked to people, did focus groups, all sorts of stuff, and took all of his evidence and said, here, FTC, look at this. And the FTC started doing their investigation. All right. So, years went by. Years went by. He basically said they're a pyramid scheme and they should be shut down. Their stock went down, then their stock went up. It's been very interesting over the last few years. And on Friday, July 15th, the Federal Trade Commission and Herbalife jointly shared the agreed-upon settlement with the public. They agreed. They came to a determination of what was the penalty going to be. So, the interesting thing about Herbalife is Herbalife is three companies. It's a U.S.-based company. It's a company based somewhere else and a company based somewhere else. It's actually three businesses. So, the one that the FTC has jurisdiction over, which is the U.S.-based business, is called Herbalife International of America. That company is responsible for 20% of their $4.5 billion in sales. So about a billion dollars of their sales, the FTC has jurisdiction over. So Herbalife said, listen, we want to settle with the FTC, but we want to negotiate the terms. So for the last, I don't know, six months, they've been working on negotiating terms. Okay, and there's been these little rumors are going to come out. A few months ago, they're going to come out with a decision, <coughs> and nothing happened. But last Friday, it did. So what did they do? The first thing they agreed to was a $200 million fine. Now, that sounds like a lot of money. Herbalife has $774 million in cash. So it wasn't that big of a problem. They agreed to a fine. What's the purpose of the fine? It's for the FTC and the court to dole out to injured victims. Who are they? I don't know. Remains to be determined. So they agreed to pay a fine. They also agreed to change their compensation plan 10 months from now. This is also interesting. Not tomorrow, not a year from now. Ten months, that's a weird number. That's negotiated. It was probably like the FTC wanted six months, Herbalife wanted ten, they agreed wanted twelve, or twenty-four, or thirty-six, they agreed on ten. So they agreed to change their company. And they said, listen, we are going to put an independent compliance auditor on board for seven years. For seven years, you are going to be monitored, and you've got to get that person on board within 60 days. They said, we're going to have this new definition. This is actually interesting. We're going to have this definition that's called rewardable personal consumption. What they're trying to say is we're going to let your representatives count only so much per month as the basis for compensation. So if a distributor buys $3,000 worth of product, we're only going to let you pay commissions on $200. We're going to make it so that distributors only buy what they really need, including tax and shipping. Right? for the next 12 months. And then, starting in month number 13, we're going to either change the amount from 200 to either $125 or, this is where it gets a little weird, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, a calculated average amount of a specific subset of preferred customers that bought stuff over the previous 12 months. We don't need to get into the mechanics of it. The point is, the definition is going to change to be something else. And this rewardable personal consumption is going to be part of the basis of compensation upon which you can pay people. So we're going to, we're going to let distributors uh, buy product. We're going to let you pay commissions on it. But we're going to cap how much can actually come from distributors. This is different than the Vima case, right? It's different. All right. Then they said, also, we need to make sure that your total rewardable personal consumption, that's up to $200 per distributor per month, all of that is less than one-third of your total company sales. In other words, we want to see at least 66% of your company sales to not come from distributors. 
bracket. Remember in the VEMA case, it was 51. So we want to see 66% of your sales not coming from distributors. What else? And we want to make sure that the total of customer sales plus the total rewardable personal consumption, this part up here, is less than 80% of company sales. Okay, they're doing this because their attitude is, look, if you want to survive as a company, Herbalife, you better have customers. So, in Vima's case, they whacked them with one hammer. In this case, they whacked them with two. What does that mean for you today? Nothing, right? It's an action against one company. My personal opinion is, Having customers, if, if it wasn't important before, it sure is important now. And by the way, having customers is a good thing, not a bad thing. Customers are good for business. It's a good thing. But it affects the design of your compensation plan. All right. You can't pay any compensation on non-rewardable personal consumption. They said Herbalife distributors will get paid only when at least 66% of their total sales Personal and downline come from retail customers. That's the two-thirds, right? So if, if two-thirds of your volume below you doesn't come from, from customers, you're getting nothing. Like the VEMA rule, except stricter. Not 51%, 66. VEMA only had to have 51. So they were tougher on Herbalife than on VEMA. Then they said, to get promoted or to qualify for your title, we are only measuring retail sales volume. Wow! So you're telling me a distributor can buy up to $200 a month. We can pay commissions on the $200 a month, assuming there's enough customers. But for rank advancement and rank qualifications, like if I have to have 100,000 points of volume in my downline, none of that volume can come from distributors. It all has to come from customers. And then <laughs> they put this in. The number of points that you assign to a product can't vary based on who bought it. So, so they were worried that, that Herbalife might actually give a higher point volume to representatives who buy the product than customers. So, so they plugged this little hole here. All right, let's keep going. There's more. Distributors can't participate in auto ship. Wow, they didn't say customers couldn't. They said distributors can't. What does that mean? It means something very interesting. It means if I'm a customer and I'm on auto ship and I decide to become a rep, I have to stop my auto ship. So they were so fearful that distributors were on auto ship just to qualify for compensation that they said, kill auto ship. And they said distributors can't participate in auto ship. My opinion is that's over the top and unnecessary. With everything else that they've got, it's unnecessary. But it's here. Then, they paid attention to what Vima was trying to do. Remember I said before that Vima reclassified people? Vima had, had said, these people that never bought a starter kit, that never sponsored anybody, that never did this, that are still buying the product, we're going to call them customers because that's what they're acting like. The court said a representative cannot be reclassified as a customer without their written permission. So someone can only be a customer if they agree to be a customer. Likewise, a customer can't become a rep without requesting it also. They also said before distributors can recruit others or earn compensation, they need to be trained. They need to be trained on the following concepts. Buy only what you'll sell in the near future. How you're supposed to document retail sales, which we'll talk about in a minute. The consequences of falsifying retail sales documentation. Prohibited and permissible representations. How to submit complaints to Herbalife and to law enforcement. They said, we're going to have random and targeted audits to verify retail sales. Now, retail sales are composed really of two kinds of sales. Sales that are made by a preferred customer through the representative's website, where I go on, I order the product under Joe. I place the order, it's shipped to me, Joe gets the product credit. And product where orders where Joe buys the product and resells it to me. He sold it to me. Well, the court has no problem with that as long as records are kept. Records are kept by whom? by the representatives and by the company. What kinds of records are we talking about? Specific data. First and last name of each purchaser. The contact information of the person who bought it. 
what you sold them, what they paid, how they paid for it, the date they sold it, and a signature if it was sold with a paper receipt. And they want that audited. So the court is saying, listen, if you have retail sales, prove it. Prove it with the paperwork. Pretty severe. In the Amway case, back in 1979, when Amway was found not to be a pyramid scheme, there were some requirements in there about retail sales receipts, but no auditing. So today, there's no auditing of it. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a requirement, but it's not audited. So, what does this mean for you? Nothing or everything? So, like FEMA, the Herbalife judgment doesn't apply to any other company. However, the FTC and other courts will use judgments like this against other companies in the future. So you have a decision to make. And your decision is, do I put my head in the sand? Do I pretend like it's 2013 and not worry about this? Or do I do something about it? And that's, that's your decision. Would you rather go to the dentist or set up your direct selling company's compliance department? Whether you would prefer to go to the dentist or not, this video is for you. There are many reasons why your network marketing, party plan, or social selling company needs to have a compliance department. In this video, I will share eight of those reasons with you. First, having an active compliance department for your direct selling company provides protection for the customer, the independent distributors, the company, the brand, the products, and the general public. Did you know that? Second, a network marketing party plan or social selling company must uphold their policies and procedures both consistently and professionally. A recorded history of enforcement is very reassuring and professionally necessary for any direct selling company. Third, owners and corporate staff, even independent representatives, can spend an inordinate amount of time addressing these kinds of issues. It is not the role of the owner or the independent representative to operate your compliance department because each may be tempted to make exceptions and thus not follow your company's rules. An objective party needs to run your compliance department properly and efficiently, updating the staff and field leaders on a regular basis. Fourth, your company must provide ongoing monitoring processes of the field and events. You must inspect what is expected. Monitoring efforts include providing an avenue for submission of potential violations. Fifth, a comprehensive set of protocols are established to hold representatives accountable. This process should include a courtesy call, then a written warning, then a suspension, and as a last resort, a termination. Each company can establish their sanctions based on their culture and their attorney's advice. Sixth, your compliance department must be the one and only escalation process with enforceable consequences. Owners cannot perform these duties efficiently and without creating personality issues in the field. Seventh, virtual compliance training is becoming increasingly popular among regulators. Bite-sized bits of compliance education is key. Some companies elect to provide a customized compliance training course for their sales force. Many require the successful completion of the course to be activated as a representative. And eighth, in the case of a compliance audit by a regulator, preparation is key. Your compliance department must keep accurate documentation so that it can be easily retrieved and provide evidence of an active working compliance department. Now you know, going to the dentist, while perhaps a little painful, is good for your health. Similarly, Setting up a working compliance department is essential to the health of your direct selling company. To learn more about compliance, 
I invite you to attend the next Direct Selling Edge Conference, where Donna Marie Saratella, a specialist in compliance, will present a class on how to set up and operate a compliance department. Often asked if simple compensation plans are safer. This is an important question with an even more important two-part answer. Let's look at this first from a legal perspective. One of the objections raised by uninformed regulators and critics of direct selling has been the complexity of multi-level compensation plans. Some of them believe incorrectly that a complex compensation plan is a symptom of a criminal enterprise. This conclusion is as absurd as saying that suits are a marker for illegal activities because white collar criminals wear them. As long as your compensation plan in practice does not violate federal, state, and local laws, it can be as complex as is necessary. Remember, the purpose of compensation plans is to motivate and reward the 12 essential behaviors we all want from a direct selling sales force. Now, from a business perspective, if you own or are, or are employed by a network marketing, party plan, or social selling company, two of your primary goals should be to attract and retain your independent sales representatives. Simple multi-level compensation plans don't accomplish these goals. A great question to ask yourself is, can you start with a simple comp plan and go to a more complex one later? Some companies think about starting with a simple plan with the idea to change their plan later on. This is not a good idea. At minimum, it will reduce your rate of growth significantly, but even worse, it may be a cause of business failure. Most companies cannot afford a do-over. Can you? For financial reasons, they need to get it right the first time. I don't recommend that you begin your direct selling company with a simple compensation plan and then change your plan later on. Here's why. 50% of the people who consider joining your direct selling company will have had previous direct selling experiences as independent reps of other direct selling companies. And about half of them will want to see your compensation plan before joining. For those who have been successful with other companies, when they see your plan does not compensate leaders well, they will decide not to join. They won't ask you to change your plan or even tell you why they won't be participating. They will just pass on your opportunity and go somewhere else. Ask yourself these important questions. One, do you want your leaders to not join your company when your company is young? Two. Can your business afford to have them join other companies and not join yours? Three, for those who do join your company, who begin to build organizations, do you want them to leave and to tell others to leave with them? When they realize the compensation plan will not pay them deeply enough. Four, do you want people to be able to earn full-time income through your income opportunity? Do you want that to be possible? With simple plans, it's too hard or impossible for that to happen. To conclude, simple compensation plans are not safer for the survival of your business. The word I would use to describe them is unsafe.
At the Direct Selling Association annual meeting in Orlando in 2017, President Joe Mariano talked quite a bit about bad actors. A bad actor is a direct selling company that is operating illegally, unethically, or both. So, how do you know if your business is a get-rich-quick pyramid scheme or a legal and ethical direct selling income opportunity? One way to find out is to thoughtfully evaluate your company using our Don't Do list. The things that you should not do are pay commissions on mandatory enrollment fees or PACs, pay commissions on starter kits that contain products while not offering at least one starter kit option that contains no products upon which no commissions will be paid. Describe your income opportunity as an investment or permit your independent representatives to do so. Have no products or services available for sale. Sell products or services that without a compensation plan have very little or no value. Before one can buy your products or services, one must first be a representative. Encourage customers to enroll as representatives to receive product discounts. Ignore cooling off laws. Have a non-existent or unfriendly refund policy or a refund policy that violates laws. Require a required purchase to be active to qualify for eligibility for any portion of your compensation plan. Have a mandatory auto ship policy to get paid on any portion of your compensation plan. Require large inventory purchases. Make illegal income claims or permit your representatives to do so. Make illegal product claims or allow your representatives to make them. Ask yourself this, how do you score? Give yourself one point for every activity on that list that your company is doing. Scores greater than zero aren't good. Note your penalty point items as targets for immediate action. And for now, consider yourself a bad actor until you're not one anymore. Reducing pyramid scheme risks is imperative, but for a longer life, Having a compensation plan that motivates and rewards the 12 behaviors is equally important. What does a good actor do, you ask? I'll tell you. Good actors refrain from the activities on my don't do list. Instead, they do other things. What do they do? They sell products or services that people will buy even if they're not making any money. They don't require their representatives to make personal purchases in order to qualify for compensation. They may require personal sales volume, but personal sales volume is not the same as personal purchases. It's important to understand that the lines today between good actors and bad actors, while blurry in the past, are firming up. They're becoming clearer. If you have any questions at all about anything in this video, let's talk. I look forward to speaking with you. I'm Jay at Sylvina Consulting. As a direct selling company, you need to know about the Federal Trade Commission's cooling off rule. There are very specific steps that you must follow to be in compliance with this federal law. If a customer buys something at a store and later changes his or her mind, the merchandise may not be returnable. However, if an item is purchased in one's home, or in a location that is not the seller's permanent place of business, the customer by federal law may have the option to return the item for a refund. The Federal Trade Commission, or FTC's, cooling off rule gives people three days to cancel purchases of $25 or more. Under the cooling off rule, one's right to cancel for a full refund extends until midnight of the third business day after the sale. By law, Saturday is a business day, but Sunday isn't. In Alaska, by state law, one has five days to cancel and request a refund. The cooling off rule applies to sales at the buyer's home, workplace, or dormitory, or at facilities rented by the seller on a temporary or short-term basis, 
such as a hotel, or motel room, convention centers, fairgrounds, and restaurants. The cooling off rule applies even when you invite the salesperson to make a presentation in your home. Simply put, the cooling off rule applies to sales made by your company and its independent representatives. Under this cooling off rule, the salesperson must tell the customer about the cancellation rights at the time of the sale, not later. The salesperson also must give the purchaser two copies of a cancellation form, one to keep and one to send in, that contains your contract or receipt. The contract or receipt should be dated, show the name and address of the seller, and explain the right to cancel. The contract or receipt must be in the same language that's used in the sales presentation. There are specific rules regarding the right to cancel and the font size that can appear in the notification. Most direct selling companies comply with the cooling off rule by asking their independent representatives when conducting a sale in person to provide the purchaser with two copies of the receipt onto which the back of each page is printed the right to, to cancel clause required by federal law. Very important, good to know. Policies and procedures are the rules that govern the relationship between a direct selling company and its independent representatives. When fully completed, they comprise about 60 different topics. Needless to say, this relationship is complicated. In this video, I will tackle one policies and procedure topic. That topic is sponsor changes. Direct selling companies absolutely need to have a policy on whether they will permit sponsor changes and, if they will, under what conditions will they be allowed. The relationship between an enroller and a new recruit is designed to be permanent, barring voluntary or involuntary deactivation. If A recruits B, B recruits C, and C recruits D, and D places an order, through the compensation plan, C, B, and A might each earn compensation on D's volume. What if D decides he doesn't like C anymore, and then D meets F and likes F too? D might want to decide to change sponsors. After all, from D's perspective, what difference does it make? He gets himself a new sponsor and everything is great. Well, while due to deactivation, a representative could be moved under an upline sponsor in the same line, Upline sponsors don't expect to lose active representatives by reason of a sponsor change. They've worked hard to recruit those personally enrolled and to teach others to do the same. Sponsor changes affect more than just the representatives requesting the change. That is why companies need to decide how they will respond to requests for sponsor changes. As a direct selling company, you have a choice as to whether you will permit sponsor changes at all. You could be firm and say sponsor changes are not permitted under any circumstance. But perhaps there are some circumstances under which you may wish to allow a sponsor change. You could be easy going and say sponsor changes are permitted upon request. But if you do this, be prepared for angry upline representatives because they don't want to lose income as a result of your decision to permit sponsor changes easily. We don't recommend this approach to anyone. Or you could take the middle ground and establish a policy that permits sponsor changes only with the approval of three or five or perhaps all of the upline distributors who would be impacted financially by a sponsor change. It is important to recognize that this approach is similar to the first approach because, in practice, rarely will all of the affected representatives agree to let the requesting representative change sponsors. They won't let the representative go because they would be giving up future income for nothing in return. Many direct selling companies permit sponsor changes if the representative quits and reapplies six months later to rejoin the company under a new sponsor, but without his or her previous downline. This is a hardcore approach. If you want to change sponsors, you must give up your business for six months. Then you could start over again with a new sponsor. 
In reality, very few individuals deliberately take this approach. They're not willing to wait. Like society doesn't want children to find new parents, direct selling companies don't want sponsor changes. Now you know why.